I want to mention, um, next Sunday, we will begin the season of Lent. Actually, the season of Lent begins on Wednesday, and we will have an Ash Wednesday service. And if you don't know what Lent is, it is a 40-day journey, a time set apart by the early church that leads us to Easter Sunday. And it begins with Ash Wednesday. And if you've never been to an Ash Wednesday service, I really want to invite you. It truly is one of the more meaningful services of the year for me. And I invite you, it'll be right here in this room at 6 p.m., and I hope you'll come if you can. And I'm going to spend the whole time, those six Sundays in Lent, through the Gospel of John. And because of that, because I knew I was going to be knee-deep in the Gospels, I wanted to intentionally spend some time in this early part of the year in other, um, other parts of the Bible. And I've been... Um, Spent a lot of time in the epistles, we did some Philippians, and today we're going to be in the book of Ezra in the Hebrew scriptures of the Old Testament. And this particular passage from Ezra has come to mean a great deal to me. I actually had never really paid attention to this passage until a minister mentioned it to me as we were both commiserating about some of our journey and um, challenges through the pandemic as, con as congregational leaders, he mentioned this passage. And since that time, it really has become something that meant something to me. I shared this passage with our elders a year ago, and today I wanted to share it with you because I think it has a really powerful message for all of us in our own lives, especially a powerful message to the institution of the church to put it mildly, the book of Ezra is really for anyone in the midst of transition. And before I read our passage today, I'm going to give you a little background of the context of Ezra and what's happening in this particular passage, because maybe it's just been a little bit since you've read Ezra full completion. So I'm going to hit the highlights for you just to refresh you a little bit about where we are. First of all, a really cool Bible nerd fact Ezra and Nehemiah are side-by-side side in the Bible. They were um, written by the same author, and for a long part of history, they were one continuous book, and then they've since been separated out into Ezra and Nehemiah. And this, the, these, both of these books really cover a lot of the same period of time in Jewish history. And we're talking 5th, uh, 6th century, before Common Era, 600 years before Jesus this is a time when the Babylonians and then the Persians ruled much, much of this area, and it is known as the Babylonian exile. And I'm going to spare you the drama of what happened, but the king of Judah and his defeat... Oh, I forgot to mention, we're talking about the southern kingdom of Judah, which has the city of Jerusalem. That They were defeated by the Babylonians in the year 586. The temple was totally destroyed. The beautiful temple built by King Solomon destroyed. The people were deported. They were kicked out of their homeland. New people were moved in. Their temple in ruins. People scattered everywhere. New rulers. It must have felt like the promises of God were just shattered into a million pieces. And then 40-something years later, the Babylonians are defeated by the Persians. And King Cyrus the Great, he had a very humble name, King Cyrus the Great decided to show mercy on the people of Israel and he told them that they could move back to their homeland and they could once again rebuild their beloved temple. Ezra covers this time period of return. Now, did everyone return to Judah? No. We know this from history that many, many people chose to stay right where they were. Why do you think they stayed? Why do you think they didn't go back home? You know, some time ago, a friend of mine in Tennessee reached out and told me that uh, she had seen that our house that we owned there on Chamberlain Avenue had gone into foreclosure and was sitting empty. And a little glimpse into Mark and Kara's personalities, when I shared this with Mark, he immediately got on the internet, started looking everything up. He was looking up pictures online and finding all the information, and I didn't want to see it. I still 
don't want to see it. It would have been our home, our first home. I didn't want to look back. I didn't want to go back. It was too hard. I just wanted to remember as it was. So we know many, many people of the Jewish diaspora that were scattered all across the Persian Empire, they chose to stay right where they were. They didn't want to go back. They had rebuilt their lives. It had been decades. But some people did choose to return, to rebuild their lives and in this community. And if you look in Ezra chapter 2, if you have your Bibles with you, you will see that actually the entire chapter of Ezra chapter 2 is just a long list of the people who did decide to return. My Bible calls it the list of returned exiles. The descendants of Parosh, 2,172. Of Shephtia, 372. Of Era, 775. Of Elam, 1,253. Of Zatu, 945. On and on this list goes. And the very end, in chapter 2, verse 64, it says, The whole assembly together was 42,360, besides their male and female servants, of whom were 7,337, and they had 200 male and female singers. They took up offerings among them to try and rebuild the temple. They collected what remains they could for the special things to fill the temple with. And then in the second year, all those who had returned began to rebuild the temple. When the foundation of this new temple was laid, they had a big celebration, a big commemoration, a time to stop and worship and give thanks to God for all that they have been through. And this is where our particular passage in Ezra picks up. So I'll be reading from Ezra chapter 3, beginning in verse 10. It says, When the builders laid the foundation of the temple of the Lord, the priests in their vestments were stationed to praise the Lord with trumpets, and the Levites, the son of Asaph, with cymbals, according to the directions of King David of Israel. And they sang responsibly, praising and giving thanks to the Lord. For he is good, for his steadfast love endures forever. And all the people responded with a great shout when they praised the Lord, because the foundation of the house of the Lord was laid. But many of the priests and Levites and the heads of families, old people who had seen the first house on its foundations, wept with a loud voice when they saw this house, though many shouted aloud for joy, so that the people could not distinguish the sound of the joyful shout from the sound of the people's weeping. For the people shouted so loudly that the sound was heard from far away. So that the people could not distinguish the sound of the joyful shout from the sound of people's weeping. It's a powerful detail, isn't it? The ones who remembered the first beautiful temple on its foundation wept when they saw this new one being built. They shouted with joy and celebration, and there was also grief and tears. Happiness, laughter, weeping, sadness, heartache, joy. They could not distinguish the sound of the joyful shout from the sound of people's weeping. Which would you have done? If you had been there, which do you think you would have been doing? Laugh? Cry? I think I would have done both. I think I would have done both. And I'm mindful there are some of us here in the room today who have seen the foundation of one temple destroyed and the building of another when our beautiful downtown congregation here burned in July of 1975. And this church at the time chose to buy a new property on the north end of town where I hear hardly anything was at that time and chose to rebuild the congregational building here. Now I wasn't there but even so I'm certain that not everyone returned and nobody 
can deny the beauty of this space today. I may be biased, but I think it's one of the beautiful congregations around. You know, Bart Tucker, the director of Fuller Center, tells me that he always tells disaster volunteers to pop up here and to take a moment to check out our sanctuary. He calls our sanctuary the Cathedral of Light. It's a beautiful space, but I'm confident that on the day of the dedication of this building, which came about five years later, there was joy, laughter, celebration, happiness, but I bet there was weeping too. For all that was lost, for all that will never be, grief and heartache, even when you're happy with the beauty of something new. This week I shared in my weekly email um, a blessing from one of the daily devotionals that I've been reading lately. And the daily devotional is called, Have a Beautiful, Terrible Day. And it was written by uh, a lady, I've quoted her many times before, who was diagnosed with stage 4 cancer in her early 30s. And she calls this time period of her cancer diagnosis the time where she realized that she had joined what she calls the Fellowship of the Afflicted. And happily now, years later, her cancer treatments are really working for her. She has mostly good health, but she does live with severe chronic pain now. And she wrote this devotional because she said that during her cancer treatments, she began to feel strange when she told people to have a great day because it just didn't fit right. She said, actually, what we mostly have are beautiful, terrible days. You know, she was sitting with all her fellow patients getting chemotherapy in the room, and she goes, we were having beautiful, terrible days. And she remembers that's how it felt to her. She would uh, be going through the chemotherapy chair, sitting there for hours, and yet also having the wonderful joy of becoming great friends with the nurse who helped care for her through that time that is still a good friend of hers. She talks about um, living with chronic pain every day, terrible pain. But in the midst of this, there is the joy of her son who makes her laugh. A beautiful, terrible day. What she realized is that all these things, they aren't just one or the other. They all happen often at the same time, that sometimes back to back, a beautiful, terrible day. You know, I was listening to an interview that she gave, and she was talking about her son, who's quite young, I'd say around 8, 9, 10 years old. And she said that um, as her son was talking about uh, faith and church one day, he just said to her, well, our faith in Jesus makes our lives easier, Mom. And she said she stopped him because she said, I want you to know that actually your faith in Jesus is probably going to make your life harder. But what I hope for you is that your faith in Jesus makes your life beautiful. She's right, isn't she? To choose the way of Christ... Like the choir sang about, deny yourself and follow me. To choose his way of love, his way of compassion, his way of forgiveness, his way of mercy. To choose his way of sacrifice and self-offering. It's not always going to be easy to do that. In fact, maybe that's why at one point in his ministry, Jesus says, narrow the door and narrow the gate. Narrow the path that leads to life. Because to choose a life of faith will ask something of us. It costs us something. And perhaps today, this is just one more Sunday, will you say, well, my minister stood up here and said something I already know to be true. But maybe, like me, you sometimes forget. Maybe you could use a little reminder today because sometimes I think we tell ourselves that our life of faith is supposed to be only one thing, only one good thing, and you forget that this beautiful, terrible life that we all have is many things, but it's not always simple. And our hearts can hold so much 
and where there is great pain, great heartache, we might be shocked to discover there's also great joy. And that you can be overjoyed with the journey ahead in your life and still feel grief for what once was, for the heartache of the past. And someday, you too might feel like you are unwillingly dragged into that fellowship of the afflicted. Or maybe you've just go through a really hard day or week or decade. And when you do, I hope, I hope and I pray that in the midst of it all, in the midst of your tears and sorrow, you look around for the beauty and the joy and look for it too. The joy of a new foundation that God is laying in your life. And guess what? Just maybe, through your tears and through your laughter, you too might say, for he is good, for he is good. And his steadfast love endures forever. Thanks be to God. Amen.